panel today to come on up because today you guys sent in some amazing questions and I'm, we're gonna do our very best to get into all of them. Um, but we are, uh, we're going to have our gals kind of answer this question. So I'm gonna have a seat. We have Hannah and Jessica, Brittany and Jamie, and they are going to introduce themselves and we'll just kind of get started on some really cool questions that you guys sent in. Before we start on the questions, I will say if, if you send in a question and we don't get to it, um, fear not. We are going to try to do something a little bit different in that um, today, uh, Becca and I are going to go and record a podcast and try to get to some of the questions that we don't get. So in, a, I think it'll be like a week or two, there'll be a podcast with some things that we might have missed. Um, also, I will say on the podcast, if you don't listen to the Devoted podcast, I'm going to give a little bit of a shameless plug for this because as you guys sent in some of these questions, sometimes some of your questions are things that we've given an entire episode to on the Devoted podcast. So there's so many that come up that um, um, I've asked the team that they're going to put on our Instagram page today links to some of these that we're going to reference because there's some things from Judy Slaughter, there's the whole series on depression we've done and different things that we're going to link to so you guys can listen more on those and get some more scripture on that if you'd like. So, okay, gals, let's start. And first, if you could just introduce yourself and then also start us off with one of our questions, actually, was people were asking what our favorite Bible study kind of things are. So, Hannah, you want to tell us who you are and how long you've been here at Athey and your favorite Bible study stuff. Go for yes. it. Yes, okay. Um, I'm Hannah Couch. And my husband and family have been at Athey for over 20 years. We just hit the 20 year mark. So I feel like we're kind of old timers. Um, and favorite Bible study tool. Um, it really depends on the season of life that you're in. Are you, a, do you have a brand new baby and you can barely keep your eyes open? Or do you have the flexibility of having time throughout the day? But for me, um, I've done lots of one-year plans, so a little bit of Old Testament, a little bit of New Testament, chronological, which is super fun just to see how the books of the Bible all fit together. Um, and then sometimes just focusing on one book of the Bible, like just going through Romans, just going through Genesis, um, and really digging apart all the the subjects there. And um, if you come to a tricky passage, I know Amy's mentioned it too, but gotquestions.org is such a great resource. It's solid, and it's like, what in the world did that verse mean? Especially when you get into Leviticus and all the things you're like, huh? Um, and so then you can go on there and be able to access that and hopefully get some answers. Uh, my name is Brittany Schultz. I've been um, at Athey for coming up on six years, and um, probably I like to put all the screens and electronics away and use like the old fashioned hard copy. Um, I love the Wearsby Bible commentary, which we have in the bookstore, um, the Strong's um, concordance, and then a good old dictionary. <laughs> Speaking my language. Um, hello, my name is Jessica Paul. Um, my husband's name is Darius. We have two girls, Eliora and Eden, and we've been going to Athey now um, I've been going nine years. My husband's been going a little over 11, 12. But when we got married, I moved from Seattle and I started attending Athey. So I've been here that long. Um, and one of my favorite study aids, um, see, I'm a little different. Like, I wish I could read books all the time. Like, I wish I had that desire. I love this book, but when it comes to other books, like, I have to really push myself to do it. So I love to actually go to the church's website and listen to sermons, old sermons. There's so many of them. And the cool thing is, is that you can um, look them up by book. So if you're in a certain book, you can look it up that way and listen to a sermon by Brett, or you can look it up by topics. But that's one of my ways that I like to do it. I like to just turn it on, listen. I still have little ones too, so sometimes it's hard to sit with a book, even when I do get that desire to read it. But um, uh, another thing would be my husband. Like I love to just pick his brain and I constantly am asking him questions. And we've been doing that from like the very beginning. So like our very first year of marriage, I would ask him questions and he would sit there and answer them with me or go through the passage with me and answer it. And the cool thing is, it's like we were both learning at that time. You know, he would then answer the question and he would pause. And I just remember this look on his face and I'd ask him like, what's going on? He's like, you know, I read that passage so many times and I never saw it in that light. So it's a fun time to pick each other's brains if you are married and you can do that. I'm Jamie O'Halloran. I've been at Athey for about 10 years now, um, married to Joe, 
I've got um, lots of grandkids. Anyway, um, one of my favorite um, commentaries, if you just want a, a simple commentary to just get you going, is the Bible Knowledge Commentary. There's an Old and a New Testament, and it's a great one. It, doesn't, it won't overwhelm you with too much information, but to just kind of give you some um, background, some good background. I love the ESV Study Bible. That also has some good background in it. All right. Well, good. I, I guess maybe I'll, I, you guys know most of my faves. So, um, but I, I, the thing I would say sometimes is sometimes you don't need any of them. Sometimes you need to pray and, well, you always need to pray and just ask the Lord to show you. I, I think I, I'm a, I like the quick answer sometimes. So sometimes you really love to reach for that commentary and just get the answer so you don't have to struggle with it. And sometimes I think the Lord would just have us kind of sit there and ask him about it and wait and, you know, so th there's that too. If you feel like you don't have any of those resources available to you, online ones, which there's a lot of free stuff or some of the great books or things like that. I also check out a lot of that stuff from the library too, or I listen to um, audio stuff from the library. So you don't even pay for it and it's, it's great. So anyway, there's some good stuff on that. Um, let's jump in. We, we kind of broke these up into categories. Like I said, we're gonna try to get to as many as we can because you guys really ask great questions. So um, this one is just kind of on, um, just kind of some daily stuff. And the question was, how do I navigate old friendships as a newer Christian? I still want to maintain those relationships, but establish boundaries to help further my new relationship in Christ. So great question. Jessica, do you want to start us off with this one? Yeah, so um, that is a great question, and it's hard. Um, you, your old friends, if they're not believers, um, you guys are not going to see the same anymore. You know, you're going to be completely different. That's the point. You want to be different and set apart from the world. And if your friends are still in the world, that's going to be really hard. But um, one of two things can happen. One, your friend will notice these boundaries and will become curious and might even start asking you questions like, well, why do you do that? Why do you believe that? You know, and one, it'll start testing you so you can then practice what you're, what you're believing and letting them know. But at the same time, um, it's a great chance to share the gospel with your friend. Um, or option two would be that they may become annoyed with these boundaries. Like you're not who you used to be. You're not the same person. I don't know you anymore kind of thing. Like it could get really just not fun. Um, and at that point, you know, it becomes really difficult, but you're going to have to step away and continue the path that you're on. You know, the Bible verse, 1 Corinthians 15:33 says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. So with time, you will be dragged down if you're constantly around them, letting them and just continuing in the old lifestyle that you were part of, um, but rather than walking, you know, the path that the Lord has now set you on. And it may, you, there may be a fear, you know, of, well, I've known this friend for my entire life. If I leave her or if I'm no longer friends with these friends, I won't have any friends. But the thing is, you have this church and you have these women and these bo this body of believers where you could make friends. And I know that sounds scary where you're like, this church is big, like, how do I make a friend? You know, and I'm like, well, I was thinking of a story of how when my oldest, Ellie, she's now five, she was maybe three or four months old, there was that Tuesday morning Bible study happening with Judy Slaughter. And I remember um, just thinking, like, maybe I should go. Like, I just, I should maybe go. You know, I could take Ellie, put her in childcare. But I kept getting this thought, like, I don't know anybody there. Like, this is going to be weird. I'm going to go by myself. You know, I had to step out of my comfort zone to go. So I went, and then I'm sitting there looking around. I did not see one familiar face at that time. So again, I'm like, well, I came, I'm here. Okay, I'll just sit in the back and call it good. So I sat in the back, and at that time, I should have been wearing my glasses and my contacts, I'll be honest. Like, I'm not completely blind. I could see people. I just can't tell if you're looking at me or are you looking past me. So I was sitting in the back, and in comes this gal, and I was like, I know her. And I just started waving at her, right? Like, I didn't even think twice. Like, I wasn't even waving at her. I was waving her down. I'm like, I'm right here. Come hang out with me. And then she gets closer, and I realize I have no idea who this lady is. And then she just comes, and she was so sweet. And she just sat right next to me, and she's just like, hi, I am. And she introduced herself, and I was like, hi, I'm Jessica. Like, just dying for that moment. I'm like, so we sat next to each other, and then the service started right then, and Judy was teaching, and then, you know, she was ending, and I was like, all right, this is my chance. Like, go get Ellie and just leave. Like, that was really embarrassing. I'm like, here I was wanting to make friends, and it didn't happen. I embarrassed myself. But then, like, 
I, you know, I said goodbye, or I was going to say goodbye, and she's like, would you like to come join my prayer circle? And I was like, yes. <laughs> like, I didn't even think twice. I just said it, and I'm like, I was supposed to leave. But I went, and I sat with these women, 10 amazing women, who in that time um, took me into their prayer circle, and we got to pray together. We got to build relationships and friendships, and I'm so thankful for that day when I wasn't able to see her in that moment, and I was waving her down because I kept coming back. I was excited for Tuesday morning Bible studies and being plugged in with these women who have seen me through some health things, you know, when they were praying for me, and they were there alongside me. And it was just looking back now, it was so embarrassing in that moment, but I'm so thankful that the Lord had it happen that way because that was the day that I made 10 new friends, Mm -hmm. you know? And and so that's a silly story, but really if you're thinking about it, as you get plugged into the church and you're serving in different ministries, you will start to make friends. Mm -hmm. So as scary as it may sound that, you know, I may not have the same friends that I did before, um, once you get plugged in, you'll start making some beautiful relationships. So sometimes we have to be uncomfortable and embarrass ourselves sometimes. That's the moral I got there, okay? (laughs) So good. Okay, then we have a couple questions, um, and we're looping these in together. Uh, The first part of the question is, uh, what does the Bible say about remaining pure, and how can we practically uh, practically and actively strive to live a pure life? So let's start with that. Um, Jamie, do you want to kick us off with that one? Yeah, um, I love that. How can we remain pure? I have just the answer for you. Psalm 119, 9, it says, how can a young person live a pure life? I love that, how it just, Scripture clearly answers your question right there. And it goes on to say, by obeying your word. That's how you live a pure life, is by obeying God's word. And, he, and it goes on to say, I try with all my heart to serve you. Help me obey your commands. I study your teachings very carefully so that I will not sin. Right there, you have great scripture to grab on, onto to help you stay pure. But there's some other good ones too. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, flee from sexual immorality. I feel like I'm at a strange angle. <laughs> My back is to them. Um, every person, every other person, or every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Another great scripture, and it says to flee. You know what flee looks like? That means run, get out of there. Um, Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to, grat- to gratify its desires. And I think um, this is kind of where the practicality part comes in. It literally means um, never be alone with the other person. That's one really safe way to make sure that you're not going to fall into some kind of impurity. And any of you gals out there that are maybe dating or um, thinking about marriage with someone, this is a great place to see how your future fiance or husband is going to lead you. If it's really important for him to be staying pure, you're, you're, that's a good indication he's going to be a spiritual leader for you, a good spiritual leader. If, um, if he's, you know, not really holding the line on that, that's, really something to think about as you're dating someone. And maybe just to fill in a, a, some, a practical question here, because this was um, the next question was kind of tagging into this, but it was talking about living in purity, but it says, I, I see many unmarried dating Christian couples traveling together, and it gives off the, uh, does it give off the perception that it's not being really set apart from the world? And, and so there is, I think both of these questions, how you live a pure life and then also just how you live above reproach are kind of all in one thing. That can be something that maybe we don't even think about what that would look like um, to someone else if you're, you're traveling together, it's not married, you're, what, is it weird? You know, so Brittany, maybe you want to just, even just generally above reproach or um, however you want to take that. Yeah, I tend to go to like the practical, okay, but what does, what does that actually mean? What does it actually look like to be above, above reproach? And uh, we see in 1 Peter 1, 13, like we are called to be holy, sanctified. Um, and so 1 Peter 1, 13 um, is to prepare our minds for action, to be of sober mind or sound mind, um, and to not conform to the passions of our former ignorance. So we know better, so we should do better, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and that all can take place just by being in your word. Mm-hmm. It, it, and, you know, Jamie already read some of the scriptures on it. 
often the Bible keeps hitting on flee sexual immorality. I mean, there are some really sharp passages about sexual immorality in particular, like it really calls it out. And we, and in other words, like it'll say the passions of the flesh and, and different things like that, that we kind of gloss over those like, oh yeah, 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 it's not, it's fine. We, we got that. I don't really think we got that culturally, you know? I mean, and even our own, our own sin nature is that way. So I think it's something we need to be really paying attention to what scripture says about that. So when it says to run away, when it says to not give any provision for it, um, that we need to be really guarded about that. I, I love that in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13, it tells us no, there are, is no temptation in which he will not provide a way of escape. Um, but it doesn't mean that escape is necessarily gonna be great, like, like meaning you're going to love it, you know, you got to take it. It's going to be there. It might not be the escape you chose or that you wanted, but, um, but it's, it's the where you need, you need to be paying attention to that. So anything else on that one, gals? There was one scripture I found that I think is a little bit funny. It says, um, it's Proverbs six twenty seven. can a man carry fire next to his church, to, to his chest and clothes not be burned? And it really is a, <laughs> you know, if you're going to play with fire, you're going to get burned. Yeah. I thought yeah. that was kind of a great scripture along these lines. Yeah. I, I, I love, first of all, just the honesty in these questions. I mean, gals, it is good to actually ask, how can I stay pure? The other question, though, sometimes is that sometimes we know the answer on how to do that, but we might, we might not want to do it, you know? So don't just ask the question. Actually obey what the word is saying there, too. Um, okay. Let's do this one. Um, I struggle with guilt over past sins. Things from long ago, even while in college, while I was away from Jesus, and I sometimes fear that I am too sinful to be saved, even though I have turned away from this sin and want to love and follow Jesus. What can we do about guilt and spiritual attacks? I was, tell, I was, tell, I was <laughs> telling the panel before this, like, oh, I haven't, I haven't been where this person is. Like, I am where this person is because we are all sinful and we've all made mistakes and we're going to make more. But... Do you, to whoever wrote this, whoever else may be thinking similar things, like, do you believe that God is who he says he is? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we see all throughout scripture, like, it is a gift. Um, you know, like, you know, we got the holidays coming up. We're probably going to receive some gifts. Like, are we going to open it? Mm, not for me. Give it back. Like, no, we're, it's a free gift. And there's nothing we can do to be more saved. And... Um, a passage of scripture that really kind of has helped me in this similar struggle is um, Ezekiel 36, uh, 24 through 26. And it's Ezekiel's kind of prophecy of God fulfilling his promise um, to his people. And so um, verse 24 of Ezekiel 20, or 36 says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And so I think this is a really beautiful picture of what he does with us in our sin. He takes us out. He takes us to where he's promised. He washes us up, gets rid of all the filth, and then he puts his heart and his spirit within us. And with that, like, you know, okay, yeah, great. I know he saved me. Okay. But it's a daily, a daily, like, real talk. There's been seasons in my life where I get up in the morning and I have to mimic putting on the armor of God. Okay. I'm going to put on my belt of truth. Okay. I'm going to pick up my, <laughs> my shield. Um, that might be helpful for you. I don't know. It was helpful for me in, in a specific season of like actually doing it, not just running through it in your head. Um, but also in 1 Timothy uh, 2.24, it says the Lord's servant must patiently endure evil. Like the enemy and the world is going to remember and remind you of your sin. And you just have to smother it with the word, with God's word. Um, because if God couldn't or didn't want to or wouldn't use your sin to help someone else, there's no way I'd be up here. No way any of us would be up here. So be in your word, smother the attack. Because in this question, it says, what do we do about guilt and spiritual attacks? You smother it with the word. 
I love that. Man, I, don't even, I can't even add to that. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, this next question, this one I think comes up on every panel, but I think it is, is worth um, us addressing because I know a lot of gals get really sucked into this. And they ask, can you address yoga? There are many Christians today who participate in yoga, but they don't know the religious roots of it and the meditation and how, how it lines up with what the Bible says. So um, I'm going to ha- ask Hannah to start us off on this. But before we even get to the question, sometimes when these things come up, and because this comes up every panel almost, or we get questions on the, on the Devoted podcast about this as well, does it kind of strike anyone? How, why, why are we asking? Is it giving you a check? Is that why you're asking? Because that could just be the Holy Spirit going, this isn't really what I want you to do, you know? But we want to get into it and like, okay, but really? There's got to be a reason. So Hannah, why don't you take that one for us? Yeah, I think there's a lot of justification, right? There's, there could be some positive things, the exercise element and whatnot, but usually if you're asking and having that heart check, that's usually a sign, right? Um, in good conscience, can you successfully say, oh, I went to my yoga class and da-da-da. But um, it, it should be obvious to all you guys, but yoga is a very, very slippery slope into the new age movement. And so you're kind of opening opening the door to possibilities. And it might never go anywhere, but that's why a lot of people have to have that check in their heart of, it's this really slippery slope. Um, You know, and if any of you guys have actually done yoga and the terminology and, you know, all, you know, the meditations and the breathing exercises and the third eye and all that good stuff, it's just a really slippery slope. Um, But specifically Romans 12, one and two says, I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable and perfect. And it's that whole idea is we are supposed to have a transformed mind, but not in the yoga meditation. We're supposed to have a transformed mind through God and his word. If you're looking for exercise, strictly exercise, there's a lot of exercise options out there that just don't toe the line of new age and yoga. Um, If you're looking for more relaxation or meditation, then the answer also is in Psalm 1-2 says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law, he meditates day and night. So the Bible tells us exactly what we're supposed to meditate on, not your third eye of understanding, but the actual Bible. Um, And then practically, if you're looking to just be, you know, if you're one that's prone to stress or anxiety and you need those true helpful tools, that's when you throw on hymns. That's when you throw on praise and worship music. You can still exercise. You can still relax and stretch, but you're filling your mind with hymns and worship songs and even the audio Bible instead of, you know, instrumental music that, you're supposed to be focusing on your breathing. Yeah. Anybody else wanna jump in there? Yeah, um, just how exactly how Hannah was saying that it is a very slippery slope and we have the Holy Spirit on us to, to warn us and to make us like, ooh, something's off. Um, and it's, pay attention to that, like listen to it. Um, I was in a car accident many years ago, and so the doctor was telling me to do stretches and stuff like that. And I was young, so I was like, okay, and they're like, do yoga. And I was like, okay, so I went, I was stretching, and yeah, it helped your back, it it helped loosen it and all that stuff. But then like when they start saying all these weird things, like, you know, now, I don't even know the the ways they would put it, but they just say, get your third eye of understanding, and you're like, what? (laughs) You know, like my third what? And then they're like, you know, and then practice, focus on your breathing, become one with your breathing. It's like, no, these things, like they automatically started to trigger, like something's not right. And so I just kept using it like, well, it's just for, you know, my back from the accident and stuff. But with time, I really did feel convicted by the Holy Spirit to just walk away because it's not right. It's not something that the Lord wants you to do to sit there to focus on your breathing. He wants you to focus on his scripture. And in that time, I was thinking, okay, when they tell me to meditate or to repeat after them, I would repeat Bible verses or I would start praying in that moment, you know, just, but it just didn't feel right. I was like, I shouldn't be here. So that was my thing with it. And exactly what Hannah was saying, it is a very slippery slope. The moment you start, you start giving excuses as to why it is okay or why you think it's okay, but really go to the word and let the word really guide you in that. And I I just, I think too, because I definitely have heard gals say, it was like, well, when I go, I just don't listen to what the person is saying. Or, you know, I, I, I just pray during those times when the class is doing the different things. 
it, it, it just is that, it's that opening of that door, yeah. you know, into that. I, I, Jessica, you were bringing up the interview. Yeah, so that that's exactly it. Like, I was using those. I was saying, well, I just pray, and I just don't pay attention, and I just get out of there kind of thing. But then I was watching an interview um, by somebody who uh, was in the world, and um, she was just saying how she had all these spell books that she would do, and she had all of these just, like, occultish books that she owned, and she, that was her life. And she was talking to the, um, the gal that was interviewing her, and she was just saying, you know, once I met Jesus, all I wanted was Jesus. She said, I was starting to get rid of all these books. I, I tossed my spell books. I tossed my, my breathing books. I tossed my yoga books. And in that moment when I heard that, I was like, okay, if somebody who was practicing these things and was in that in the world is saying, I threw away my yoga book, like that to me right there was just confirmation that you do not need to be anywhere near that stuff. Yeah. Just something to be really sensitive to. Very discerning. Got to keep your discernment up on that for sure. Um, okay, let's switch to... Uh, this was a very fun question, and this was sent in by a sweet 14-year-old girl, which if we have any high schoolers in here, so proud of you. Um, but this, uh, this gal asked, she said, what advice would you give to your teenage self? So I would like everybody here to just to chime in quickly... <laughs> First, give props to the 14-year-old that she's asking for this. I love that. Um, but Jamie, what would you tell 14-year-old Jamie? <laughs> I think um, just stay in the Word and make your identity in Christ. That would be number one. And the second thing is don't worry about what other people think about you. And now, you do need to care because we are ambassadors of Christ. We're representatives of Jesus Christ every day. So you want to care and make sure that you are representing the Lord well, but don't worry about what other people think, what you're wearing or how you do your hair or all those things because no one really cares. It's true. It's true. Um, I would also say just to be in the Word, to establish those routines from an early age of getting up early and studying your Bible. I wish I did that more as a teen, but um, I'm thankful that I get to do it now. But just for any young kiddos out there listening, mm -hmm. just do that. And then, like Jamie said, just don't worry. But I think mine would be more when, um, when trials hit, have the word ready and don't worry because the Lord will see you through them and he does have answers for you in the book. Mm -hmm. That's what I would tell myself. As well, I have read your Bible. I grew up in church, born in church, you know, the whole thing, but still it wasn't until I was in college, probably even late in college, that that routine of being in the Word um, really kind of started to kick in. And then I also have don't date. As a teenager, preach, don't date. <laughs> There's plenty of time for that later. I just love this right here. Can we all say amen? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I, same. So focus on the Lord. Um, a lot of times you might want to be looking for the next step, looking to grow up, looking to this, maybe not the responsibility part, but the fun part. And it's just to trust in the Lord's timing. He's where he has you now. And so as a teen, focus on the Lord, avoid the drama, um, and just be, just be a sold out Christian because... This is the time where you're going to start creating those habits that are going to enter into adulthood. Um, whether it's putting boundaries in place, whether it's reading your Bible every day, whatever that is, those are going to start the groundwork for when you're an adult. It's not like those of us that are adults. We turn adults and all of a sudden mature desk gets sprinkled all of us and everything's great. It's like you're, this, you're practicing and establishing these habits and these routines now. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think I would say a couple of things. One is actually you can't, I couldn't say that to my 14 year old self because we didn't have this, but 14 year olds today do. And I would say, uh, get off your phone, get off your phone. And I know I'm gonna sound like every mom, like you're gonna roll your eyes and like, oh my word, the phone thing again. Get off your phone. I mean, especially like when you start talking about when we get on uh, the, the links with depression, anxiety, all of, I, I, gals, it's, you can't deny it. I mean, I think we know it. Like, I mean, if you've ever taken a break from social media or your phone and all the, you know, the 500 notifications and all the text threads and all that stuff, if you've taken a break for a substantial period of time, you're like, huh, I feel a little bit better, you know? Um, so if we're honest with ourselves, that really is true. Um, but it's just, it, it's such a time sucker. So, okay, there's, there's that. I've been very mean. 
Um, this one's gonna sound really mean too. So, um, <laughs> and this one I am saying to my own 14 year old self, you don't know everything. <laughs> you do not know, Amy. Your dad knows more than you. Your mom knows more than you. Almost everyone knows more than you, <laughs> okay? And I, I, I will say that I, I may or may not have in some points in my children's life written notes that I've had them put in their pockets that says, I am wrong. <laughs> and told them to read that before they actually have any conversations that day, you know? Because, and it's not to be mean. I know you're like, wow, your encouraging lunchbox notes are really great, Aim. <laughs> But the thing is, is we need that. We need to know, I think it just gives, I wish I had known that because I think it would have put me in a, in a, in a different posture to even be looking at the word as this is, this is the boss, like recognizing those authorities. How many things in our culture right now is telling our kids to like buck authority and you don't need authority, you don't need any of this stuff, you're wrong. I mean, that, you, you, we have so many of those messages that you grow up and then you're sort of like, well, is this the authority too? I mean, I, I don't know if I really need that. Don't I know more? We don't know. So I could say it to my 14-year-old self, I could say it to me now. I don't know. We don't know everything. And I think we need to have an, just an attitude of humility regardless with our relationships with our parents, with the word. We don't know stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm done being mean. Okay, um, how about a little bit of, um, here, we'll just do this one really quick. Hannah, we had um, one question on discipline, and we're all just gonna overall, this one that says, discipline, when to start implementing, how do you explain to a two-year-old that you do this out of love and not hatred? Um, I wanna say, uh, we're gonna recommend heavily Debbie's mom time stuff with this. She's gonna do another one of those next year. I think it's April, May, um, and there's lots of teachings on this. Brett's done some really great stuff on this, so I would really recommend you look at and actually listen to those sermons he's done on Proverbs. And you, like they, the gal said, you can go to the website and search by topic, and it'll pull up things. So look at those, and then open the Bible yourself and read Proverbs, read what it says about that. Um, for yourself, for you to do that as well. So you wanna take that one real quick? Yeah, so start young, 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 young. So by two years old, they already know that their little sin natures come out and you are seen at full force. So start young, but with age appropriate consequences. We should never be disciplining for childish mistakes. They spill the glass of milk and it's truly an accident that does not warrant discipline. It is um, a heart issue. So if they're being disrespectful, disobedient, if there's safety, that's when discipline, but think heart. Don't think silly childish mistakes. Uh, but they ha you have to start early because people, including children, have to know that there's boundaries. And when you cross the boundaries, there's consequences. That's real life. That's why there's um, prison as an adult, right? Like, or juvie as a, like, that you, you disobey this rule, there is a consequence and they have to know it and they have to learn that there's authority, that they are not the boss of themselves, um, that the Bible, even as an 80-year-old person, uh, the Bible is the boss of me, right? So um, there is authority, there's a hierarchy, not to be punitive, but to teach boundaries. And, um, you know, Brett has always said this, that sin's not, sin's not bad because, what is it saying? Sin, not Every, forbidden. it's not forbidden, it's not forbidden because, because it's bad, bad. bad. it's, yes. Or the other way. Yes, yes. <laughs> But it's, it's to teach them that there's boundaries for a reason. And as they get older, you can explain the why. But as a two-year-old, they don't even need to know why. They do need to know that you love them. So when you're disciplining a two-year-old, never do it in anger. Always show them so much grace and, grace and love afterward, whether it's a hug, whether it's a prayer. As they're older, talking about how do we move forward? What does this plan look like going forward? Because I want the best for you. Mm -hmm. um, so never out of anger, but... Um, always, always dripped with grace and love because that's how the Lord corrects us. Yep. Yeah, and it's a great, also, um, just a great time to share the gospel with your children too. As little as they are, they'll, they're still listening and they're still going to take it in, but like letting them know that, you know, you forgive them for what happened and that um, if, that, that's what Jesus is like with us. Mm -hmm. That when we mess up and when we get in trouble, we go to the Lord and we go before him. And though there may be consequences down the line, he forgives us also. And that we can move forward as if 
nothing had ever happened because he forgets it east to the west, right? Same thing, like you're, as a mom, you're not gonna go, hey, remember what happened earlier today kind of thing? It's like, no, you also need to east to west kind of thing and forgive and forget kind of thing with your children so that they can see it firsthand what it looks like um, to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. I think we could all talk on that for like an hour, but I, there's a lot to get to, but I will um, just kind of defer to those. The one thing I will add to is if, you know, for this gal or anybody else, if you're in that boat, maybe first time mama, maybe you got a couple kiddos and the discipline route, you don't really know. Maybe it wasn't modeled to you. Um, still check out those sermons and get into the scripture for yourself. Talk to your husband about it. We also have the Titus 2 ladies that come there. You can go online and fill out a form and two gals will meet with you and they'll come to your home and help you like practically look at like, what does a plan for this look like? And that can be so, so helpful to hear just from an older woman who's raised her kiddos and, and hear how that works. And then I would say, hear what those gals say. And then still you go to your husband and you talk about what does that look like in our family? So that's something that's also available to us here at Athey as well. Um, the, let's see, we did have a question, and I, I think I'll just blanket statement, we, uh, that was, what is the best way to teach biblical womanhood to our daughters in this coming age during what we're seeing right now? So, I mean, I've already mentioned that we're actually so passionate about this, we're going to do an entire study on it. So, you guys want to add anything to that one? Yeah. Shameless plug, come to the spring study, and actually pay attention to what the Bible says because the world's going to say the exact opposite. We are fighting tooth and nail to raise up godly women in this culture. Um, and it's okay to be called weird. It's okay to be called different. In fact, that's what the Bible says. We're supposed to be set apart from the world. Um, but we have the Bible as our guide. We have that as a compass. And um, that's the why behind why we're doing it. Yeah. Um, I have a, ha a favorite scripture along these lines. It's 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Make it your ambition, like this is your, your goal in life, your drive, is to live quietly, to mind your own, fa own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders. And I love thinking about that scripture for biblical womanhood. That's a great one. Okay, so I'm going to leave that one there. We're going to transition over to... Um, these questions are specific maybe to marriage, but as we were talking about, we're like, wow, this is every gal, married or not. Um, so the first one, what does it look like for a wife to build her home um, and or destroy her home in her heart? What does that look like? Uh, I don't know. Brittany, you want to start? Hannah? Sure. I'll start. Um, yes, so Proverbs 14.1 says, the wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. So you have a choice to make in your house. Once again, you're married, you have kids, or you're single, you still have a house. You could be a teenager living with mom and dad still. Um, but you have a house, you have a family, you have roommates, you have someone in your house, and you have the option to make that house be an encouragement and building it up or tearing it down, truly with your own hands, as the Bible says. So some extremely practical bullet points of how do you build your house? What's a practical way? Are you an encourager? Are you a discourager? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic, right? So are you an encourager? Are you building people up in your house? Are you humbling yourself? And if the Lord wants to work on you, are you willing to ask for help to say, Lord, mend these broken places? If you have a husband, are you respecting him? And are you loving him? Are you working hard? Are you being intentional? Are you being patient? And are you being gracious? That's a huge one. Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It doesn't say sometimes gracious when you feel like it, when you got enough sleep that night. It's always be gracious. And the opposite is, Brittany. Again, I, I go for the practical. Okay, but what does that really mean to tear down your house in foolishness or with folly? And so, one, go and just read Proverbs. Like, just, just read it. <laughs> um, but to tear down a house, and as a single woman, like, again, this extends to relationships with family. You, you live somewhere, so that, that's your home. <laughs> um, Proverbs 18, 6, a fool's lips walk into a fight. Do you start fights? 
Proverbs 12, 16, vexation of a fool is known at once. Are you easily upset? Proverbs 14, 15, do you believe everything? Proverbs 18, 2, um, takes no pleasure in understanding. Do you love to talk but hate to listen? Um, especially for these single ladies, and actually not even single, um, just the culture we live in, we're supposed to be independent women, right? Proverbs 28, 26, do you trust in your own mind? Are you independent or are you seeking wise counsel? And then Proverbs 10, 23 was the last one. I mean, I could keep going, but um, do you make light of sin? Proverbs 10, 23 says, um, doing wrong is like a joke. So just some of the practical, clear ways that we could tear down our own home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? I think a really important way to help build your home is to have meals together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Eat dinner together. Whenever you can. Yep, that's really good. Well, Jamie, I'm going to let you take this next one um, because it kind of links with this because a lot of the things when we're talking about building our home, um, it seems that our mouth is the thing that typically is going to get us in all kinds of trouble. I love when James says that it's like a fire. Like, ooh, okay. We all have pictures of what fire does now. We live in a forest fiery, you know, area and we, we've seen the destruction that that is what our tongue is likened to. So that should give us a little bit of a pause right there on that. But number 16, whether it is what we say or attitudes we have, but this question said, my husband says I'm grumpy. I am unhappy in our marriage. He isn't leading us spiritually or financially. And he says, I just need to change my attitude. How do I do this? Jamie? First of all, we really appreciate whoever wrote that, your transparency and honesty, <laughs> that you are grumpy. Um, but your husband is right. You do need to change your attitude. And you, you want to be, um, the woman sets the tone for the home, the mother does, the wife does. So you want to be filled with joy. So me, my first scripture I thought of was uh, Nehemiah 8.10 that talks about the joy of the Lord is my strength. That will be what gives me strength. And then I thought about James 1, 2 through 4, count it all joy when you encounter and meet different various kinds of trials. Well, living in a marriage is going to be a trial. And having a husband who may not be meeting your expectations is a difficult thing. But what you need to focus on is what you can do, how you can change, how you can become that godly wife that the Lord wants you to become. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6 is a great scripture to look at that, to really, um, it talks about having that quiet and respectful life that um, really speaks loudly, and it says in there that you win him over without a word. That's back to what Amy's talking about. We, our words do get us in a lot of trouble, and they can, our words can get in the way of the Lord trying to do a work in our husband. So we want to make sure that we're staying out of the Lord's way. We're not nagging. We're not um, conveying dissatisfaction. We want to be respectful and honoring to our husbands. And it's just uh, really important to remember that um, to be praying for your husband especially. There's a great little book we always <laughs> like to recommend. It's called uh, Praying God's Will for My Husband. I think it's by Lee Roberts. I think Amy's going to put it on the website or whatever, make it accessible. But to be constantly praying for your husband, especially if he's not, you know, he, you don't think he's the spiritual leader or doing some of the things you'd really like to see him be doing, go to the Lord in prayer. And you focus on what you need to be doing to become a godly wife. The thing I love about that book she's referencing is it's all scripture. Um, because it also is easy to pray and like, okay, and it, using your prayer is like, this is my laundry list of complaints that I have. Um, and that's why I like that book because you yourself are getting in the word too. And there's, it, you know, that's the Lord works that way. There can be those scriptures that you're praying for someone else. You're praying for your husband, maybe that you think is not doing what they're supposed to do never fails. There's going to be something probably that you need to be doing as well. So I, I love that we can be praying scripture specifically over that. Um, and I also just reminded when it was the, well, he's done several, several sermons on this, but whenever Pastor Brett talks about somebody's got to die, you know, um, just, just die, you know, it just is such, I know that sounds like, well, that sounds easier said than done. 
Yes, but, um, but it's, you know, if you think about that being the competition of, you know, as, instead of looking for the other person to do all the things that you think they should be doing right, um, just die to your thing, you know? I don't know. Do you guys want to add to that? Romans 12.10 says, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, that's a healthy competition. Who can show the most honor? Um, but for a dissatisfied marriage or for discontentment in life, no matter what stage you are, an acronym that we talk about a lot in our family is JOY. So JOY, obviously have the joy of the Lord, but the J stands for Jesus first, the O stands for others second, and the Y stands for yourself last. So if you're discontented, if you're grumpy, if you wanna have kind of a your attitude, are you putting Jesus first? Are you thinking of others second? And then lastly, yourself. I think it's very hard to in this culture uh, because everybody says, but you deserve fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. You deserve to be happy. Uh, the, my husband and I recently, we, we got a new car and this dear car salesman, poor guy, he was kind of losing us. We we're like, no, we just can't do it. We just can't do it. And then he pulled out the, but don't you deserve this car? And you all laugh because if you guys have been around me for five minutes, you're like going, oh, wrong audience. <laughs> and the poor guy, I said, oh no, I definitely do not. I, I didn't go into like children of wrath and you have no idea what a wretched <laughs> sinner I am. I didn't go there, but it was tempting. But the thing is, is that that is everywhere of what we deserve this. And so it's, I get it. It's not that, no marriage is perfect. There's no way, e even if, whatever the situation is for her or uh, any of us, it's, it's not like it's ever a perfect situation, but that discontentment that, you know, the thing that we think, but I, but I deserve this, I need to be heard in this. I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's just die to that too. You know, I, I, that, that joy, I love that. Jesus, others, yourself. Put that order, that hierarchy together, and that is amazing. Anything else on that one? Just a very practical thing, if you are that grumpy wife, <laughs> or not, um, I really recommend gratitude journals, and just, you need to get a pretty journal, because girls like pretty, and every morning, first thing, write down three things you're grateful for, and keep it, um, try to really focus on the day before, so that you're really seeing the Lord working in your life every day, and it might just be something simple, like a sweet little bird flew by that you just felt touched by, I don't know, it can be anything, but just where you really feel like the Lord has shown himself to you. And as you keep doing that, you're going to be just amazed at how much you see the life, the Lord working in your life every day. Mm -hmm. One more marriage question, and this one had to do with, um, and I'll, it's kind of a long question, so I'll summarize, but it's a situation where, um, her husband's kind of struggling in his faith. And so some of the things that he says and some of the attitudes he has, even in front of the kiddos, is less than, you know, it's not a godly representation necessarily. This gal is trying to be respectful and be like, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't want to correct him, but I also want to model good behavior to my kids. Um, so I don't know. Do one of you guys want to jump in on that one? We all look at Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> As, as Jamie is getting her thoughts together. No, you go ahead. Um, go for it. <laughs> it is crucial that the kids are not the audience. So when you bring, want to bring these issues to your husband, it should be um, without the children around because that is a, a huge slap in the face for him as if he's already struggling and doubting his ability to lead, doubting his faith. So mm -hmm. that's when you and him have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And um, the ultimate thing that you can do is you can't change his heart. You can't change his walk with the Lord. You can't change his thoughts, but the Lord can. And so pray, pray, pray. That's more of that gratitude journal. It's um, constantly praying scripture and then praying to the Lord to say, Lord, how can I still represent you well to our kids, even though the kids are seeing this dichotomy in our family, but um, still still being respectful and not not throwing your husband under the bus ever, but especially in front of the kids. Yeah, I love that. Um, again, I just would really emphasize, you know, just working on your own heart as well. But if, you're, if you are in a marriage like that where there's some tough stuff, um, have you considered fasting? I know Amy's mm -hmm. spoken about that several times, as has Pastor Brett. And it's a great way to really lift your spouse up before the Lord. 
So I would encourage that. Um, mm -hmm. And go before the Lord and ask him how he would like you to fast, or if at all. But I think it's um, when you are really burdened in a situation like that, the fasting can just be a great tool that the Lord will use. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Um, this one is a tough one, and, and, um, but this comes up quite a bit, and, and I know this is really tricky. Um, so I'm just going to read this gal's question so men, <laughs> we can reiterate how these sound. But I have two adult children in their 30s, a boy and a girl, who accepted Jesus as their Savior at a young age. They are no longer walking with Jesus because of some comments, events, and activities we're questioning if one or both of them are gay. We don't know how to broach the subject or how we should respond if they t do tell us that they are. So I'm going to lean to you. It, Jamie's also on our uh, biblical counseling team here at Athey. So we, that's, we, we're like, you're, you're our wisdom, Jamie. So yeah. Anyway, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> um, you know, it's such a time of pain and confusion when these things happen in a family. And it's... Um, you know, you're kind of at a loss. How, you know, what do we do here? How do we handle this? And I, there's just a few ideas that I'll throw out to you. Um, respond calmly, respectfully, and really try to be non-reactive. And this is assuming, you know, they're maybe coming to you and telling you this, this is what's happening. Don't panic. Um, really try to reflect Christ's character. It's so important to maintain a relationship with your children. And I think I can't emphasize enough to hold to your biblical convictions. You need to be that rock in their life. Their life is sand. It's shifting. It's unstable. And some, at some point, they're going to need that rock, and it needs to be you. Or as a grandparent, it's, and it's hard because there's lines that we don't know exactly. You know, there's a lot of gray lines. Do you have them over? Uh, with a partner, you know, for dinner or, you know, just uh, different things that you have to deal with. But just um, be that rock. Hold firm to your biblical convictions. And Amy shared a scripture. It really struck me um, not long ago. She said in, it, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, we do not rejoice in wrongdoing. And that's just talking about not... Um, because we, want, we don't want to lose them, and so we have a tendency to want to be accepting. We can, be, we can have unconditional love and, and be affirming of them as our child, but we don't want to accept the wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. I, I, the only thing I just would add on this, just not like generally on this whole topic, I think sometimes Christians, we swing in a couple different directions. We either view... Um, same-sex attraction or anything that falls under that umbrella as an unpardonable sin and that they're too far gone that that you just can't do. Like, and it, it is sin. It most definitely is sin. But then there's also the group that swings the other direction and says, oh, no, no, no. It, it's, you know, they're, they're, the world says they're born this way and, you know, and it's not a sin. It is a sin, but it is not the unpardonable sin. And, and I think sometimes we need to have a right um, attitude even of the, our own sins, that guess what, our sin is just as gross and yuck as everybody else's sin. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it can help even to remove that stigma of like you've done a sin that's, that's the one that we just can't talk about even. And I don't think it should be that, you know? I, I think we need to have a right just perspective on sin. But like Jamie's saying, you know, she's referencing the, the, it's the love chapter in 1 Corinthians that's talking about, you know, love is patient, love is kind, all of those things. But it says at the end, it, it, does, not, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing. So the patient, kind, loving, all of that, those amazing things of that scripture, those are equal truth to does not rejoice in wrongdoing. You got to have both. And and so, and, I, and that's why we always refer to how Jesus is such a great model of this, the, the speaking words. He always spoke gracious words. One of you guys upstairs said, he didn't sometimes speak gracious words. He always spoke gracious words. But, how, but he never said untruth either. He never uh, was, was enabling someone in their sin. So 
man, think about that. How can we do that? How in those conversations, and I think this looks different in everybody's relationship, but I, I think sometimes what we hear is that we have to have the relationship above all. I have to keep relationship, and that is true, but that relationship could look different because the relationship might not necessarily be what it used to be when everybody was on the same page, you know? And so there can be differences and changes in that relationship. You can still have it, but it, it may look different, you know? I don't know, am I making sense? Do you guys wanna to add to that? They're just nodding at me, like, I don't know. But I, I do just think sometimes we as Christians don't wanna talk about that in the church, and like it's, it's just, they're too far gone. And that's, there, ladies, we can't do that anymore, it is everywhere it's it's touching people's families and your kids friends like crazy and we need to be we need to be lights we need to be love but we need to be truthful and we need to be bold it is not kind you know all those scriptures we talked about sexual immorality and how it says it's you know it it destroys your own your it destroys your own soul sexual immorality and all of those sins that come in that well that's kind of encompassed in that so we should be like wow no we want to protect and we don't want to enable and reinforce a sinful behavior. So, um, okay, let's go to this next one. It, was, it says in 2 Corinthians 6, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them. And this gal says, I have three sisters who are not just unbelievers, but in radical support of abortion. They each took part in parades and were all in with all of those things. They know my beliefs and have told, them, and I've told them about Jesus and given them beautiful Bibles. But my question is, what should my relationship be with them? So this is kind of what we were just talking about a little bit too and talking about what those relationships can look like. But the last part of her question is she says, it's very lonely to be in this family. So how can we encourage her, gals? They're all looking. <laughs> Amy's been talking too much. <laughs> I think, you know, if we, if we always looked at Jesus as our example, he, he lived in a family where no one accepted him <laughs> for 30 years. I mean, none of his brothers became a disciple. It wasn't until after he was resurrected that they, they all got on board. And it is a lonely place to be. Um, but I, I just think it's very comforting to remember that that's the environment Jesus lived in as well. Um, and he knew that loneliness. I like um, what it says in Mark 3.21. It talks about, they said Jesus was out of his mind. And that's his family. So, you know, if you feel like your family's saying negative things about you because of your faith and, and your commitment to the Lord, um, just remember what the Lord went through. And I think, you know, I, I don't know if we really think about when he says in Matthew 13, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. So I, Jesus knew what that felt like to be surrounded by unbelievers in his own family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's just um, to remember that your fight is not against your sisters, but really it's a spiritual warfare and that that's all around us. And to just keep fighting the good fight and to just keep being that light for them because um, you're kind of planting seeds, you know, by giving them the Bible and by talking to them about Jesus. And you just never know if one day something um, is going to happen in their lives to where they're going to say, I need to talk to my sister about this and come to you. So just mm -hmm. keep being that light for them, keep praying for them and keep fighting that good fight. Mm -hmm. And practically put boundaries in place. If you're feeling burdened or weighed down by um, how much they're telling you and how much they're sharing and how much it goes against your faith and your convictions to just put healthy boundaries in place. Still love them, but don't endorse or love the sin or their lifestyle. So um, like these girls said, be that rock and be that person that um, when those sands are shifting for them to come to you because you know that you're a, a, a safe and truthful person for them to come to. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we are getting close to running out of time, but I want to try to hit two more. So one of them, uh, mostly just because I would love this panel's take on this, and I, I always just think it's fun to hear, but the gal was asking on Psalm 37.4, and uh, she says, the, the verse says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your hearts. Other than reading and knowing the word, how can we truly know whether the desires we have in our hearts, especially when the Bible says our heart is deceptive, are given from the Lord versus what we personally might want? How do we know whether to give up on a desire we keep asking the Lord for something 
if it's his will, can you talk more about this verse? So anybody can jump in on that one. Um, I think the more that you are in the Bible in your reading, um, the more your desires will align with what the Lord's desire is for your life. Um, if you are, silly example, wanting a sparkly pair of shoes for church and you want to steal them, that's not something that you should be doing. You know, there's 10 commandments about that. Don't steal. So that desire is wrong, right? Like that's a silly desire or a silly example. But really it's that when you're in the word and you have these desires, like you want to be a mom, you want to be a wife. These are godly desires to have them. And um, I've always just thought that the Lord is, God's a good, good father. And he's not going to want you to desire something for a really long time, knowing that he's not going to give it to you. I truly believe that with time, as you're desiring these things, he will change your heart to really match what he has planned for your life. And by being in the word, I think you will be guided in that way. Mm -hmm. I like to jump back to verse three. So Psalm 37, three, um, because it, it, before we get to the, you know, the part that she's asking about, delight yourself in the Lord. It says, trust in the Lord, do good for God's glory, feed on his faithfulness, and then delight in the Lord. And yeah, as Jessica was saying, I think as we are doing those things, we're putting our trust in him, we're doing good for his glory, um, feeding on his faithfulness. Um, I think, you know, our desires, there should always be kind of that godly root to them. But as we're doing these things and as we're learning about him and who he is, if those desires are not of him, I think we'll slowly start to see them change. And your prayers may start to change for what you're, you're wanting or asking of him. Um, yeah, so I like to go back to the verse three, focus on that, those, and then you get to the delight part. I'm always, whether it's encouraging or not, you know, we think that if you've been praying for something, even if it's like a couple of years, that seems like a really long time, right? Some of us are like, okay, well, no, even a week is a long time. But some of the, the, the things in scripture that we read in like two pages, sometimes are like 30 years that, and I mean, and I'm not trying to make that sound super depressing, but the, the Lord's timing is perfect. Mm -hmm. He's perfect. So he's, he, he, can't, he can't do it wrong. And, um, but it just is, our timing is very different than what the Lord's is. And so I, I love the delighting part because if we're really delighting in what he's doing right now in your life, um, it'll, that will, that will it'll be what you're focused on and not so much the things that you don't have right now. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And the question you can ask yourself is what is good? Because what we call good might be very different with what the Lord has for us, what he calls good. So to just always lean in on him and say, well, I think this is good, but ask the Lord, is this your will or is this just, is just this, my, my mm -hmm. desire is my will? Mm. Good stuff. Okay, I'm going to end with this last one. Um, you're like, it's kind of a sad note, but I, I, it's, it's sad and it's not because of the eternal perspective. But the person asked, when someone is on their deathbed, um, mostly unresponsive, how do you approach talking to them about Jesus and salvation? So I'm going to, Hannah's our, our medical person on, on the panel here. So why don't you go with that? Medical and spiritual all together. Yeah. Um, so studies absolutely show that unresponsive people can still hear. There's been tons of documentation for that. So you talk to them as if they can still hear you, even though they might not respond and you might have any clue, but you're still talking to them as if they can hear and know exactly what's going on. But providing calm, reassuring words, um, even playing hymns or worship music in the background, praying for them. Um, but ultimately, we can't know what's in their hearts. And I'm reminded of 1 Samuel 16, 7, that says, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So I wish there was a great answer that says, yes, when they blinked their eye that last time, that meant that they're saved, but we don't know. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows where their heart is. Um, but you can do as much in those final moments of giving them peace and calm and reassurance and prayer. Yeah, I just wanted to, I guess we're going to end with that one. But I think I, why I want to do that is because like she's saying, you don't know. And we, they've said in different things, you don't know the seed that was planted by that Bible you gave that gal. You don't know what seed was planted by different things. 
And that's, that's the thing, we just don't get to know all of the things, and we're about to go into Thanksgiving where we're going to have interactions maybe with family and friends that we don't typically see very often. Um, it isn't up to us to really know how it works out. I'm really excited to get to heaven someday, and we get to see, finally, oh, that's how that worked out. Um, but until then, it, it, it just adjust your perspective to be okay not knowing, and just instead, Focus on the eternity part. Focus on actually sowing the seed. Um, you know, in those last moments of with your loved one or, you know, around the Thanksgiving table with somebody who's very contentious. Sow that seed, be faithful, be gracious in your words, and share the gospel. You know, it, it, it sometimes, you know, in, that, in the deathbed situation that you're thinking of, it's, it's so easy to go, well, I look, I seem silly right now. You know, what if somebody walks in Eternity is on the line. It seriously could be. So share, this is not a time for us to worry about what we look like or sound like or any of those things, but to be really bold with the gospel. And we're all gonna have opportunities that probably in the next month um, or so, and take those, you know? Maybe that's actually sharing a word. Maybe that is just in the relationship, the smile that you have with the Fred Meyer clerk, okay? Those, those people are always stressed out this time of year, so <laughs> smile at them too. So, all right, let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your word. As we have looked at these questions, Lord, we, we're so thankful that we're not, it's not looking to any of us up here or any of us in this room for the answers to these things, Lord. You, you are the answer, Lord. And, and Lord, sometimes your answers aren't necessarily in ways that our, our finite brains can totally get around, but we trust you. We know that you are good. We know that your plans for us are good. We know that, that you have ordained each of our steps, each of our days. You know our, our very breaths we take and you know the day that we get to go home and be with you. And so Lord, I, I pray that we would just be able to just rest in you, that we would be able to trust you wholeheartedly as your scriptures say, that we wouldn't hold anything back. Um, Lord, I pray as these gals have shared just about us being it's just smothered in your word, Lord. Lord, would we be women that just desire to be completely submitted, devoted to what your scriptures say, whether it feels good, whether it's what the world says, um, but Lord, we just want to walk in obedience with you. Lord, I pray for anything that was spoken up here, Lord, that if, if we spoke anything amiss, Lord, would you just erase that from these gals' minds? But Lord, if there's anything that your spirit would just really be saying to the hearts and minds of gals here in the room, those online, Lord, I, I pray that we wouldn't just be women that hear the word and then just go about our day, but that we would really be doers of your word also, Lord. So um, I just pray uh, your blessing. I pray that you would just cover these gals uh, and even over these next, this next holiday season, Lord, would you bless their homes? Would you bless their conversations, Lord? And, and would we just be filled up with your truth and be willing vessels of your gospel, Lord? In Jesus' name, amen.